Welcome to RPV City Talk on the Road. I am Liz Brown Swanson with the great mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor David Bradley, here to give us his monthly update of all things happening in the city of RPV and at the city council level. And But we are first going to start off with what you could call some wild news here in the city. And I'm going to let Dave explain what's going on that's quite wild in our community. Go Wild Peninsula. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> we just got done with the press conference and the celebration of the uh, kicking off of the Go Wild for the Peninsula campaign with the uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula Land Conservancy, which was uh, the celebration of a joint public-private partnership between federal wildlife agency, state wildlife agency, county wildlife, as well as the city and the Land Conservancy, a nonprofit. We just were able to bring the last 96 acres of uh, undeveloped property in Rancho Palos Verdes into conservancy. And this increases the amount of land in conservancy up to 1,500 acres within the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. So we did a local press conference and helped the Conservancy kick off their uh, campaign. Right. The press conference is right here. Um, the mayor earlier, hours earlier, you were up at the podium along with, like you were mentioning, local officials from the peninsula, the Land Conservancy, elected leaders from also the federal and the state level, which just shows how it takes a village. Pretty incredible that this, for one, the scene center, because right here, as you were mentioning, Mayor, this 96 acres that through the partnership of the Land Conservancy of the city has acquired is right here. It's called Lower Philly Orm Property, um, right off Palace Verdes Drive South is where we're sitting. You can't, I mean, this view, does it get any better? You can't get a better view. It was a beautiful day, and the fact that we were able to come to fruition of uh, a 49-year dream mm -hmm. of local control and open space preservation within the city of RPV. At the eve of our 49th birthday as a city, on the crest of our 50th anniversary, we were able to complete the 1,500-acre acquisition for open space that will be in preserve for perpetuity. It can't be a better day. And to walk our community through just how this all came to be. So like we mentioned, this is 96 acres right here. It's surrounding us and they're calling it a wildlife corridor, meaning that this is going to go from the land here right down to the coast of down coastline by Abalone Cove that you're going to restore it for really wildlife. It's not for the two-legged animals. It's not no. like going to be hiking trails up here. Kind of explain what is going to happen to this 96 acres that is going to be in addition to the 1,400 acres we already have in the preserve. So one of the big things that's going to happen is we're going to rededicate this land to native plants, which is going to help in wildlife preservation, fire prevention, and also reinstall native plants that will help our endangered species. So the Palos Verdes Peninsula blue butterfly, which is one of the most endangered butterfly species in the country, uh, will install some native habitat to hopefully help them flourish, um, as well as some of the other native species of plants and animals. So it's really exciting. Um, and it will continue to keep the the semi-rural feel of Rancho Palos Verdes into perpetuity. Right, and so this partnership that we have, the city with the Land Conservancy, the Land Conservancy manages the preserve and will be in charge of the restoration here. And I talked to the executive director, um, Adrian Mohan, of course, about the plans going forward as they've kicked off what is gonna be this $30 million fundraiser campaign to help support there's not just the purchase of the land, but the, re the restoration. And she said that, you know, stay tuned that probably by next year is when we'll start to see things happening with land improvements, like bringing goats in um, to help with, of course, you know, for fire suppression and right. things like that. One of the things that the Conservancy wants to do is to eradicate some of the non-native species, mm -hmm. uh, the mustard plants that have a tendency to grow wild in the spring and they then become a, wild, or a wildfire hazard later. Uh, the acacia trees that have uh, sprouted up throughout the um, open spaces within the peninsula, which are also a fire hazard. So uh, trying to go back to the uh, inherently drought tolerant native species uh, that will also help the wildlife. It's a great day. Um, can't wait to kick off that campaign and to uh, help the conservancy as they try to bring more and more of the uh, land back into its native state. Yes, that Go Wild for the Peninsula campaign, you can go to the website, which is gowildpv.org. And again, it they're looking to have this $30 million campaign. You know, part of it was for purchase of the property, which was through York Properties. We're right next to, you know, Jim York's Catalina View Garden. So big thanks to the fact that he was, you know, we were able to, you know, purchase this property for the good of the community and really 
for the environment and for generations to come. Right. And, you know, we're sitting here not only on the new property, but we're over, overlooking Abalone Cove, which couldn't be a more spectacular day to look at Abalone Cove with the tide pools and the nature uh, down to the uh, off of PV Drive South. It's it's spectacular view today with our views of Catalina um, across, the, across the bay. Abalone Cove, an incredible resource for the community and also the where you've seen the Land Conservancy do a lot of um, restoration and rehabilitation. We with plants, what is a year ago, you had the Tongva Monument was unveiled. Right. Um, p- place that we just celebrate so much in the community. There's the tide pools, you know, school kids are going down there for trips. And one thing I was curious, do you have, um, is the number of visitors that come here every year? And it's been summertime. Do you, I think there's quite a few people that will come visit. Oh, absolutely. So that's one of the um, parking spots that we have to give access to the coastal area down there, to the tide pools. Um, so it is one of the places, some of the visitors, and it's much easier to park there. And it's just a, a fantastic place to come, especially during the summer yes. uh, when we have uh, longer days. And I think there's about 60,000 visitors a year, I was told by staff. And uh, just the parking revenues alone generate nearly, you know, a quarter million dollars for the city. Because we're talking about Abilene Cove, it's summertime. We're, it's still summertime till September 21st. Summer's way busy here in Rancho Palos Verdes. How about, as you as mayor, you want to give us a bit of a state of the city? How did we fare um, in Rancho Palos Verdes from public safety to baby park projects, public works projects that took place during the summer that you can update the community sure. about? So uh, we're about halfway through uh, the year, um, actually a little bit more than halfway through the year. Uh, the summer has been great. Um, we continue to come out of the pandemic. So uh, the city has been opening up. We've been able to have some of our major events. Uh, major uh, one was starting off with Whale a Day. Then we had the 4th of July celebration. We've been doing the uh, movies in the park um, up at uh, the Civic Center. So all of that has been great to see the community come back out and be able to start um, to uh, see each other again. We've uh, been uh, trying to focus on crime suppression. So with the uh, LA County Sheriff's Department and the Lomita Sheriff Station, and we've been making some great progress. So uh, residential crimes are down. Um, We've been focusing on uh, reducing uh, traffic violations. So speeding Mm -hmm. throughout the city. Um, We've uh, had the Sheriff's uh, Department uh, do some traffic calming and focus on some areas that had gotten a little out of control. So we've reduced uh, the speeds in some areas. So all in all, the city has been having a phenomenal summer as we've come out of COVID um, and we're going into the last part of summer. And I'd say whether it's summer, winter, fall or spring, this Rancho Palos Verdes is the place where people want to be at. There's so much that we offer um, with open space and just this beautiful city that we have often referred to as Los Angeles playground. Yes. Uh, This is a great place to play. Um, And so with that, um, one of the biggest resources we have that attracts so many people is the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. Um, And as we talk here in the show always about things before city council, um, you, the city council at its last meeting in August, you got an update about what's happening with the preserve. Do you want to give us some um, uh, takeaways from that update? Yeah, we had the annual um, uh, report from the Palos Verdes uh, Peninsula Land Conservancy on the state of the preserve and the uh, mitigation efforts that have gone on. Uh, the conservancy is trying to do restoration back to a native state of five to six acres per year. Part of the Go Wild for the Peninsula uh, campaign is to drastically increase the amount of uh, resources they have to bring more than five to six acres a year uh, back into its natural habitat. So uh, that's kicking off. It's really exciting. So they have uh, uh, looked at uh, the native uh, animals um, and the flora. Um, Palos Verdes blue butterflies um, are not coming back quite as fast as we would like. So one of the things that we need to focus on as we continue is uh, restoring habitat for the Palos Verde blue. Um, but they did do a count for the Palos Verdes Blue, mm-hmm. the El Segundo Blue, uh, the Gnat Catcher, and the other uh, endangered species. And by and large, things are going very well. Um, also, before the City Council, again with the preserve, is one thing the Council has been working very diligently at, is to provide access and to deal with parking solutions on impacted neighborhoods like Del Cerro. Um, you got an update at the August 16th meeting about the park mobile system yep. that's been implemented now, I can't believe a year ago, right? A year ago in July. Um, so what were the takeaways from the status report? How is it working? Uh, what are the, what, where are we going next? 
Well, one of the things with Park Mobile and the parking up on Crest in the Decelero neighborhood is we really were trying to mitigate the impact of folks that were coming into the area to recreate. Uh, the Park Mobile app was uh, one of the uh, tools that we were using to try to mitigate some of the uh, parking congestion. Um, we always knew that it was not going to be perfect and we were going to have to do some tweaks. So we've taken the uh, latest um, a report from staff and we're making some tweaks. Um, we are probably going to change the terms of the parking um, and look at how we can make it more efficient and also solve the problems that it was originally there to solve, which was the congestion, the double parking, the triple parking, the people making U-terms, and really preventing the uh, neighborhood from getting into their residence. So all together, we're trying to make it a win-win for everyone, for folks coming up that want to come into the Burma railhead or trailhead, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the Rattlesnake uh, trailhead. Both of them we are doing upgrades on the, um, the fences and the gates to um, uh, allow access uh, during sun, uh, uh, during daytime hours. Because the entrance there at Del Cerro, which the intersection we're talking about too, where the parking um, reservation systems in place, Park Mobile is at Crenshaw and Crest Road. Correct. But that is the busiest, one of the, it is the busiest access point to get into this preserve here. Yes? It is uh, one of the busiest access points that we had. And yes. um, during the pandemic, there was a huge influx, um, probably five, 600 percent increase in folks that were trying to park there and the amount of uh, of usage that we are getting at that one trailhead. So uh, part of the mitigation is the city is trying to help alleviate that, yes. spread things um, out, uh, have people park at uh, Civic Center where we have more parking, more access, um, and just uh, make it a better experience for everyone. Clearly it's working because I think during your city council meeting, um, in terms of feedback from the community, the HOA at Del Cerro, ha you haven't had complaint letters to say that, you know, I think people are pleased that they know everybody's really working hard. At I this. think they're very pleased with the mitigation. Yes. I think they have appreciated city staff's diligence in trying to solve the problem and come up with a win-win solution for both the community, the local community, as well as the larger community. Now we're going to move on to talk about, I don't know if you want to call it a problem, but the, what's going on with uh, the housing, affordable housing issue. Um, and uh, the city council in August, usually you meet twice a month, but you had an additional meeting, which was to um, have a public hearing about the draft housing element um, that has been complete right. for, and, uh, and uh, being submitted. So can you explain to the residents what does this all mean? It's very, very important that you know the community understands what the obligation is for this city in terms of filling in housing on all levels, not just affordable. Um, so I'll let you take it away, sure. Mr. Mayor, with explaining where we're at with that housing element plan. So the housing element is one of the sections of the general plan for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. And as part of the RENA uh, allocation, which is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment allocation for Southern California, we had to update our housing element and we had to get it into the state uh, housing community development community development thank you um, all <laughs> I know these the acronyms, acronyms. <laughs> exactly we take these acronyms and we use them so often they become words so and then sometimes we forget what they actually stand for but anyway, we had to get the housing element updated and into the uh, the uh, HCD for their review uh, they needed 60 days review um, before our housing element had to be um, approved or we would have been in non-compliance mm -hmm. with the uh, reach state legislator now this housing element just has to show that we have a plan for zoning for the ability to uh, produce 648 additional housing units throughout the city. And that is for all income levels. So that's low, moderate, very low mm -hmm. um, uh, throughout the city. One of the things that the city council has really tried to do is spread out that across the city without concentrating it in one part of the city and really making a mess out of any specific portion of the city. Um, the city continues to push back on those numbers. Uh, the 648 units within a city our size and with the infrastructure and how built out it is, is almost impossible to do. So we're really challenging HCD and we're really pushing back uh, to try to maintain the semi-rural lifestyle that we have really come to love, um, but while trying to also be compliant with uh, state right. statute. I know, and this, this, the draft element that's put together, like in trying to work with the community and make this all come together, initially locations that were scouted around the city to put in these units, these homes, um, 
has been reduced to about 30 areas. I think there was 50 plus sites maybe that were right. um, could have been designated. One of the areas that was looked at is where Marymount Cal California University is up there off um, PV Drive East. Um, the numbers of units that were initially going to maybe go into that area as we all stand by to see what's going to happen to that property um, it was scaled back a lot right. as well. So I think, you know, it's, the city's doing all that you can to minimize the impact. And, you know, just to keep density, compliant. that's something that's that doesn't affect our quality of life. Correct. Right? I, mean, I know the process of coming up with the final draft housing element um, that's been submitted now to the state has gone on. You know, there's been workshops, meetings. Can you? Is it, what's the next step now that it's been submitted? So we put the initial through. We got comments back from HCD. We've uh, gone back to them with questions. In fact, HCD even came to the city and walked some of our sites. Mm -hmm. uh, the draft element has gone back to California, to the state, to Sacramento. Uh, they have 60 days to uh, review our updated draft and to provide us additional comments. So I um, assume that they will come back with additional comments. Uh, we hope that they will approve it within their 60-day review cycle and that we will be considered compliant. And uh, then we will have uh, three years to implement um, what is in the draft element. Okay, we're still going to continue to talk about housing issues in our city before the city council at your Absolutely. August 16th city council meeting. Uh, public hearing was held to introduce an ordinance that addresses the housing impacts of Senate Bill number nine regarding what's things like urban lot splits, uh, two unit developments and what are single family zones, unit zones. So what does this mean for residents and property owners? What's going on with this ordinance that's right now in, in, the, in the works? So SB9 was the urban lot splits and the uh, ability to put uh, accessory dwelling units or ADUs um, by right um, on certain properties. Uh, this is our ordinance that is going to codify what you need to do mm -hmm. to be able to be compliant with that. We want to make sure that there, it's done safely. It's done in areas um, that have egress uh, for uh, fire safety. We want to make sure that there's infrastructure to support all of those additional units in ADUs um, and that we don't uh, over densify any specific area and make it unsafe for the public. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to make sure that uh, we allow for uh, additional housing stock to be built, but built in a safe and efficient way that's uh, supportable by the land and uh, supportable for fire safety. Okay. Anything else you want to add on this topic that residents should know? Um, and we've been no, talking think, about Senate Bill 9 for a long time now. Absolutely. So we've been talking about our arena numbers. We've been talking about the L housing element. We've been talking about Senate Bill 9, Senate Bill 10. Uh, there's many housing element um, ideas that are going around right now. Um, a lot of them have to do with taking local control away from uh, city government, um, which is one of the things that this our city was founded upon was uh, save our coastline, uh, local control, being able to be in control of our own destiny and get away from the idea that Sacramento and a one size fits all is the way to go. Um, we live in a very high fire zone and, you know, ultra high density is not the safest way to build here. So mm -hmm. we need to be able to uh, moderate uh, and be safe uh, while still trying to meet the goals um, from Sacramento. Uh, but we're continuing to push back on those uh, local control issues and wrest local control back to the city level. Right, there's movement, there's legal action being Absolutely. taking place right now. I think you also brought that up at the council meeting that if in fact this Senate bill gets reversed, what does this mean if you have you know these kinds of ordinances on the Correct. books? Um, you know, but there, there'll be ways to work with that. Get Correct. It take it one day as it comes along right. um and um but if you want more information on this topic just get on our city website absolutely there's tons of information on the housing element on what sb9 means what sb10 you can read the draft ordinance and the city staff and city council is always interested in our residents uh, thoughts and uh and uh, letters now I'm going to have your thoughts from the August 2nd City Council meeting. I think maybe you were even traveling. I was. And Mayor Pro Tem. 
Uh, Barbara Ferrara ran that meeting, but some important topics came up. A couple ordinances uh, were introduced at the August 2nd meeting um, aimed at protecting the public and the environment. Um, the first ordinance has to do with the unlawful possession of catalytic, con catalytic converters. Correct. Um, the other had to do with preventing the distribution of single food, um, single use food, single items. use food accessories like plastic utensils. Yep. Um, so, just can you give us just a general overview of these two measures and what what the, why this is before the council and what's going on? Sure, catalytic converters have been one of the highest uh, theft items out there lately. Uh, the platinum that's in a catalytic mm -hmm. converter is very valuable. So, you've seen several models of cars target extensively for catalytic cur converter uh, theft. The problem that we've had is the LA County Sheriff's, um, even the City of Los Angeles Police, have very little tools to be able to arrest people unless they catch somebody taking off a catalytic converter, basically catching them in the act. Um, so what had happened would be people would have 10, 15, 20 catalytic converters in the back of a pickup truck, and they'd say, oh, they're ours. But because we never were able to catch them in the act, we could not arrest them. Mm -hmm. So this is an ordinance within the city to say, you have to have a bill of sale right. for the catalytic converters. You can't just, uh, with a presumption that they're yours, you have to prove that you've obtained them lawfully. This just gives uh, the Los Angeles County Sheriff another tool to help us uh, prevent those thefts. Um, on the single use plastic items, uh, this is, um, intended as a win-win, help the environment, but also help our local businesses and give them an ordinance where they don't have to provide these single-use plastic utensils uh, for takeout, uh, only on a request Right, basis. so when you order takeout, you're not supposed to be asked, do you want napkins, this Correct. and that. If you request it as a consumer or customer, you, that's okay, but it's... Absolutely. It's I know I personally have a entire shopping bag full of plastic utensils that we've gotten uh, for various takeout. Um, when we bring it home, we usually use our normal uh, uh, silverware Mm -hmm. and dinnerware, but we have all these plastic utensils. We don't throw them away. We collect them in a bag um, under the idea that someday we might use them for a picnic. Right. Unfortunately, this is now going to be a picnic for about 1,500 people. Right, exactly. And all this ends up in our landfills. The, it's tons and tons, millions of exactly. tons of waste that so, they're aiming to, to keep out of our out of our environment. Um, even like those single-use packets, like ketchup correct. packets and things like that. Exactly. That pile up in your Right. car so well good so then so that was that, that all happened at the beginning of august um now we're going to move on to talk about uh, fun stuff going on in the city it's always fun in our pv especially Absolutely. with you as mayor you're like the king of fun but i don't think you were the king of the pie eating contest on the fourth of july but we won't bring that up <sighs> i don't want to bring that back up but i did oh <laughs> sorry we're going to talk about one thing that's near and dear to your heart not the pie <laughs> contest but the core city because you've been there, and yes. we are sister cities with Socorro City, and I can't believe it's been two years. It is. We've we had, had our a recent, partnership with them. Absolutely. We had our recent uh, anniversary of our second year of codifying the sister city relationship with Socorro City. I fortunately have had the opportunity to actually tour Socorro City. Yes. Um, phenomenal people, very like-minded, um, and our exchange program with Merrill S. Intermediate School with an mm -hmm. intermediate school in Sakura City continues. Now it's back in full swing now that we're out of uh, the pandemic, but we were able to celebrate our uh, second anniversary. Third anniversary is going to coincide with the 50th anniversary correct, correct. of the city, uh, and the city council, or actually the mayor and a couple of the city council uh uh, people from Sakura City will, come. will be here for our 50th anniversary celebration uh, to tour the city and to uh, to celebrate the third year of our sister city. Uh, and the second year celebration was done virtually, um, and you participated in that. Uh, what were some highlights for you? Did you? I think that was a traditional Japanese dance that they were they were teaching. I don't I don't know how you clicked your heels. There on that. was a traditional Japanese dance. We did try to do the dance. I hope that has been stricken from every uh, city website. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> that that, uh, that 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 should be stricken somewhat like my loss in the pie eating. Yes, contest. we're going to put that you've got. Uh, yes. But uh, Hugo, um, one of our students here within the city who also received a uh, uh, citation from the city, Japanese-American heritage, uh, was born in Japan. This is was a 10-year-old violin player. 
virtuoso, virtuoso violin player was able to play another concerto uh, with his uh, violin teacher uh, as part of this celebration. Um, he speaks Japanese fluently as well as English fluently. Um, so it was really special to be able to add that to our celebration. And I thought we could wrap up with a special mayor's announcement with just because of the city's 50th anniversary campaign kickoff, September 7th, 17th. 17. I've really taken us back. September 7th, <laughs> 1973 uh, is 49 years ago. We're in the city first incorporated. So now we're kicking off the build up for the one year party that we we'll are. have um, next year. But what an exciting way. T let's tell the residents what's going to happen to kick off this campaign in September. Uh, so in September, early next month, we will be kicking off uh, the 49th year, and we'll be having an event every year, every month mm -hmm. uh, for the entire year. The first event is going to be the renaming of the Rancho Palos Verde Civic Center in honor of Councilman Ken Dida. We had to make a special exception to do this, but the fact that Councilman Dida is currently serving on the city council 49 years after he was one of the founding city councilmen and really helped found the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and was uh, instrumental in the Save Our Coastline um, campaign, uh, the fact that he is continuing to serve on the council 49 years later is a tribute to his dedication to Rancho Palos Verdes. And we thought it was only fitting that on the eve of our 50th anniversary that we renamed the Civic Center after Councilman Ken Dida, um, which will set us up for our 50th anniversary and the Civic Center Revitalization Project, which is one of the major capital um, efforts that is in front of the city as we look to redesign the Civic Center uh, to a new modern Civic Center that all will, will serve all of the residents of Rancho Palos Verdes. Yes. Um, when you mentioned about uh, council member and founder legend Ken Dida, um, being part of the original Save Our Coastline, that, that how, how we incorporate it as a city. And as we sit here on this beautiful coastline on this gorgeous day, I think we need to dedicate this city talk to Ken Dida. I agree. I couldn't agree more. Uh, if it was not for Councilman Ken Dida, we would not be looking out over a beautiful rural coastline that is uh, home to many native uh, species and plants, but we would be looking at a very dense coastline that was uh, completely built out and it would have a, just a completely different topography than we currently look at. I don't think it would make this perfection is if we had a Palos Verdes blue butterfly come flying by, but it, I, I know that, we, that it's butterfly, not the season. That it's butterfly not the is season. waiting in the wings. Exactly. <laughs> waiting in the wings. Pun intended. <laughs> it's always great to be with you, Mayor Bradley. Thank you for your service. I can't believe we're more than halfway through um, with all you do for our city. And, and um, we are having a terrific year in Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, with that, I'm going to say we're going to sign off here at Lower Filiorum. Um, I feel like on top of the world. We are on the top of the world. I'm Liz Brown Swanson. I'm Dave Bradley. And I'd like to say in closing... Let's go wild for the peninsula. <laughs> Thanks for joining us.